Now, what about the initial ownership of a file? Well, the owner is simply set from the effective user ID of the process that creates it, but the rules for setting the group are more complicated. It all depends on whether the directory you're creating it in has the set GID bit on or not. If it doesn't, then the group of the file is the effective group ID of the process that creates it, and this, I suppose, is the, the normal behaviour. If the set GID bit is on, then the group of the file is inherited from the group of the parent directory. Also, if the set GID bit is on for a directory, it will automatically be propagated down to any subdirectories created subsequently. And this makes it possible to create a subtree of the file system designed for sharing by a group. In fact, I'm not telling you the complete story here. There's a mount option called GRPID that controls the default behavior in terms of initial group ownership. Changing ownership is straightforward using the ch own system call, which can change both the owner and the group of a file. You should just specify minus one for the ones that you don't want to change. There's also l ch own The difference is that ch own follows symbolic links and l ch own doesn't. Be aware that only root can change the ownership of a file. Now, non-root users can change the group, but only to some other group that they are actually a member of. Now, these restrictions about who can do what explain why, for example, if you extract a tar archive using a regular user account, the files you extract will all be owned by that user. But if you extract it as root, the ownerships will be set to match those on the archive. Now, the ch own call, of course, requires the numeric user ID. But if you know the user name of the intended owner, you can use get pwnam to map it to the numeric user ID. And here's an example. Here, we're looking up Alice in the user account database, uh, getting back a password structure. And then we reach into that structure to get the user ID, which we pass to ch own. In this case, we're doing the lookup the other way round. We're wanting to print out the owner, the username of a file. So we begin by doing a stat on the file to get the numeric user ID of its owner. And then we call get PWUID to map that back on to a username. Notice the two different approaches to returning a structure. In the case of the stat call, you allocate the struct and pass the pointer in. In the case of get PWUID, the library allocates the struct and passes the pointer out. And notice that in the latter case, there's only one copy of the struct and it gets overwritten on each call. So if you want to store several results, you'll need to copy them out into your own storage. More subtly, this behavior makes the function unsafe to use in a multi-threaded application. This kind of lookup, of course, is what happens if you do an ls minus l, uh, so that ls can show you the login name of the file's owner. Now you'll see I've handled the case here where the lookup fails, and you might ask, how is it possible for a file to be owned by a user that apparently doesn't exist? Well, the account may have been deleted after the file was created. Or the file might have been extracted from a tarball, say, from a machine where a UID was present that isn't in use on your machine. Now, the program I want to demonstrate to you here does show the use of the ch own call, but it also pulls together several other system programming features. The purpose of the program is to transfer ownership of files. It's a bit like the ch own command, but not entirely. Now, usually I show you the code first and run it afterwards. But this time I'll demo it first so that you can see what it's supposed to do. And then we'll look at the code. So here we have a directory set up just for the demo. 
notice that two of the files here are owned by Chris and one is owned by Jane. Now let's run our little program. It's called transfer and it takes three arguments. The existing owner name, the new owner name and the name of the directory we want it to process. And after running it, if we do the ls minus l again, you will see that the two files that were previously owned by Chris are now owned by Mary. The file owned by Jane, on the other hand, is untouched. As far as I know, this is behaviour you can't get with the traditional chown command. OK, let's move on and look at the code. There are quite a few header files included here. There are quite a few variable declarations. But the executable code begins with a loop that's processing the command line options. Now, in fact, there is only one valid command line option. That's minus G, which says that we want to change the group of the files as well. In which case, we set the variable G flag, which is being used here as a Boolean. Once we've processed our command line options, we make sure that the rest of the command line looks sensible. We are expecting uh, three arguments, the old owner name, the new owner name, and the directory name. And if we don't get that, we complain and exit. Otherwise, we move ahead, we open the directory we're trying to process. Now, we're picking up from the command line the old and new user names, but we need to map them onto numeric user IDs. So we call get pwnam to do that for the first user, and we do it again for the second user. If either of those users is not found, then we print an error message and exit. Now, there's a little bit of conditional debug printing. This will only be executed if the debug symbol is defined when the program is compiled. And in this test here, we're implementing a policy that says you can only give files away to root if you are actually running with the real root user identity. This is a half-hearted attempt to make the program secure, and I'll have more to say about that in a minute. Now we get down to the heart of the matter, we are looping here over all the files in the directory, so this is fairly standard directory traversal code. We have a test here that says, does the file currently belong to the first user, and is it a regular file? And if both of those conditions are met, we do a chown on the file. This is really the heart of the program, changing the ownership to be the second user, and then we have here an example of the question mark colon operator that's interrogating G flag and it's either setting a new group on the file or not, depending on whether or not the G flag Boolean is set. So that's basically the code. There's obviously more detail there that I've skipped over. And if you have a plus subscription to Pluralsight, I'd recommend that you download it and spend some time examining it. But let's actually rebuild the program with GCC. OK, and we'll try running it. And this time, we'll put the ownership of the files back from Mary back to Chris. And you'll see it fails. The own commands are failing because I can only do those as root. So how come it worked the first time? Well, because behind the scenes, I'd set the program to run set UID to root. So let's do that again. Let's set it up to run that way. The first thing we need to do is to change the ownership of the executable to be root. And the second thing we need to do is to set the set UID bit. Let's just try that one more time. OK, that's better. Let's just check the permissions of the file now. And you see there, well, it's showing it is 
in red because it's quite alarmed that this program is running set user ID to root. But notice the S there and the fact that the executable is now owned by root. So now let's try running it one more time. Same command as I had before. Now we don't get any error messages. And if I do the ls minus l, we see that indeed the file ownerships have been changed back from Mary to Chris. So that's the program. Now I really need to issue a big government health warning here, like they do on the cigarette packets. This program is inherently insecure and you should not implement it except in a test environment. Allowing ordinary users to change file ownership is not a secure thing to allow. Uh, finally, I want to let you into a little secret. I originally wrote this program back in 1997 and I was probably demonstrating it then on a Sun workstation. It certainly wasn't on Linux. And you know, I haven't had to change a single thing to make it compile on Linux. And I think that's a spectacular testimony to the stability of the core systems programming API that we're focusing on in this course.